Well, good morning. Um, we are uh, back in class this morning, and I am, as you can tell, on the movie screen. I'm not here. I am currently up in Colorado, uh, visiting my oldest daughter and chasing three of my grandkids that live in Colorado around a little bit. Uh, but this morning, I'm also speaking at my daughter's church. So this is kind of one of those fun things that due to technology, I get to be uh, teaching uh, God's Word here in Levine Baptist via uh, recording and live there in um, Colorado Springs. Um, talk about another prophet, uh, Zechariah, and his kind of view of the end times as well. So it's kind of fun stuff. So I, I am bringing your greetings to them, and when I get back, I will bring you the greetings from that um, Southern Baptist Church there in, in Colorado Springs. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the wisdom and knowledge that you have granted to mankind that allows us to do things in this manner, um, to be able to record everything here and um, make it playable and, and visible and to be able to be watched by, by others at a, a later time. Oh, that's just fantastic. But what's even more fantastic is your love for us. The fact that you had Daniel, that you spoke to Daniel, gave him these words, and that he faithfully obeyed and wrote them down. That now here, all of these centuries later, we can read them and see what you have for us to know. Father God, we don't want this to be just a, a merely a, a academic learning time, though. We want this to become a part of who we are, that it moves us ever closer into the image of yourself. But Father, that it also makes us people that follow your great commission because we know what you have said is true because everything that you've said already has come to pass. Everything, without fail, exactly as it was written. Father, I thank you for all that. I ask that your Holy Spirit now would just actually indwell this room and anybody and everybody who, is, who has a chance to watch this video, that your Holy Spirit would actually be the teacher and the speaker here to make your word clear so that we know where we need, where we are, and where we're going, and how we should go about doing that. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. We have entered your throne boldly as your adopted sons and daughters through the work of your son, Jesus. And for all of that, we say thank you. Amen. Okay, we are going to pick up kind of where we left off last week. Um, I do have handouts for you. They're the same handouts as last week, and as promised, I filled in all of the stuff that we did last week so that if you didn't bring it back with you or it's you know sitting in the back seat of your car somewhere or, or whatever, you have those. But if you have last week's, you can just take that out and continue on because the, the outline and the fill in the blank isn't going to change. There's not additional homework, that sort of thing. Um, I, I want to do a quick review to kind of catch us back up. I know it was kind of like drinking out of a fire hose last week with all of these different uh, Ptolemy this and Seleucid that and this Ptolemy king and this Antiochus and, and all of that. So what I've also prepared and it should have been handed out to you already. If not, I've got a couple of guys that will be handing these out and it's this which is a timeline of what we've already looked at here in Daniel chapter 11. So it lists those four more Persian kings, uh, the dates that they ruled, the mighty king, of course, being Alexander the Great. And then I have that Egypt versus Syria. And I have the Bible verse listed down the middle so that you can go back in and look at Daniel chapter 11, look at everything that we looked at last week and see which... Ptolemy king out of Egypt, which Seleucid 
king out of Syria was involved and the prophecies and what was happening there. And if there was something really um, important, I kind of noted that underneath there just to help you focus on all that. So you can kind of go back to the last week's um, using this and keep that all straight in your head uh, to one degree or another. Um, and you can thank my wife Cynthia for that after we got out of Sunday school last week. She said, man, you need to put together some sort of a, an easy to view timeline so that everybody can kind of follow along with that. So um, I, hope you, I hope you enjoyed that as well. Um, and I'll, I'll be back next week. We're going to close out Daniel next week, finally get through the book as Daniel gets his final instructions. Um, let me do kind of, I said, a quick review then to just touch a couple of points from last week to catch us up to where we were. So Daniel was told that there would be four more significant Persian kings and then the great king from Greece, which of course is Alexander the Great. And the Greek Empire would be broken up into four parts, and we've seen that in several of these uh, prophecies through the book of Daniel. We, we know about that. And that the great king would not have a successor. And again, history lets us know that uh, Alexander the Great's two sons were both murdered. Pointed that out last week, and so his four generals break up his, his kingdom. The prophecy from that point here in Daniel chapter 11 really focuses on just two of those kingdoms, Egypt or the Ptolemaic Empire based out of, out of Egypt and the Seleucid out of Syria because it's those two of the four kingdoms that Alexander's empire that have to do with Israel. As, as they're fighting for control of Israel and other areas, whatnot, so everything from there focuses on just those two. We ended up last week having just met the final king listed in this, this final Seleucid king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now in previous um, uh, prophecies in Daniel, we've already been introduced to him as that little horn that comes out of one of the four horns. and. Being that he's a little horn, he's a precursor or a, a, a forewarning of that final little horn, which is at the end times and that, that the, um, what Satan raises up as his man to rule as opposed to Jesus, who of course is the actual king. So Antiochus IV Epiphanes is a little horn, but he's just kind of, and he's bad, but he gives us a foretaste of what that final little horn guy is going to be about, the Antichrist. Antiochus seizes the throne that should have gone to his oldest, his brother's oldest son, and we saw that he may have been involved in the murder of the younger brother. So where Demetrius, who's being held hostage in Rome, and of course we also learned last week, and history tells us that Antiochus IV himself was once a um, hostage in Rome, so he had a good idea of what that was like. But instead of making sure that Demetrius, who was temporarily held hostage there in Rome, who should have been the next king, he runs in, Demetrius' younger brother is there, he runs, he comes in to, you know, kind of help his nephew, but then his nephew gets murdered by a guy who then Antiochus immediately has killed. And of course there's great speculation that he was probably involved in that as well, and so now with no successor actually physically there, he takes, he takes the throne. And scripture says that, you know, the royal honor was not ascribed to him. It wasn't supposed, it wasn't designed for him, but he goes in and seizes it. There's still conflict going on between Syria and Egypt. And now there are two Ptolemy brothers 
Ptolemy the sixth and Ptolemy the seventh down in Egypt this Ptolemy the sixth comes up he's going to try and regain some of, of the land they once controlled up in Palestine he gets whooped real bad by the Syrians by Antiochus and his forces he's actually captured and held hostage but he makes a deal with Antiochus that if Antiochus will go back into Egypt with him and help him and set him up as king then they'll have an alliance Antiochus does that he ends up kind of raiding Egypt but then after he leaves the two the two Ptolemy brothers end up working together to keep Antiochus out of coming of, out of Egypt and coming back and it's after that initial raiding of Egypt, as Antiochus is on his way back, that he finds that full-on insurrection going on in Israel. And he responds, as we kind of talked about last week, by killing 80,000, which is recorded in, in uh, the apocryphal book Maccabees. 80,000 Jews, men, women, and children raiding the temple with the help of Menelaus, the, the false high priest, the brother of Onias III, who was the high priest, but who was murdered, and Menelaus, his brother, had helped that happen. And now, because he was working with the Syrians and he was promoting um, the Greek culture there in Israel, He's set up as, as high priest. Where we left off last week, and that was just a quick gloss through, through everything, because there were so many battles back and forth between that Antiochus or, and that Ptolemy and whatnot, and I gave you that, and again with the breakdown, you can go back through and look at the verses as it talks about the struggle back and forth between these two empires. And as I also pointed out, there, there's something like 135 very specific prophecies in Daniel 11. We're not done yet. Um, and history shows us that all of them, exact, have come to pass. But even with that killing of 80,000 men, women, and children, and that's the kind of the teaser that I left off with last week, the persecution had just really begun. So we're going to pick up now in Daniel chapter 11, verse 29 to 35. We're continuing to talk about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who's now in control of Israel and who in a previous prophecy has been called a little horn. One moment. So, Daniel chapter 11, verses 29 to 35. At the appointed time, he will come again to the south, but this time will not be like the first. Ships of Kittim will come against him, and being intimidated, he will withdraw. Then he will rage against the Holy Covenant and take action. On his return, he will favor those who abandon the Holy Covenant. His forces will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress. They will abolish the daily sacrifice and set up the abomination of desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who act wickedly toward the covenant, but the people who know their God will be strong and take action. Those who are wise among the people will give understanding to many. Yet they will die by sword and flame and be captured and plundered for a time. When defeated, they will be helped by some, but many others will join them in Syria. Some of the wise will fall so that they may be refined, purified, and cleansed until the time of the end, for it will still come. The time of the end will still come at the appointed time. 
So now we have the second Egyptian campaign and more Jewish persecution. Antiochus has decided he's going to go back and take some more valuables, raise more money, kind of do another raid on Egypt and see if he can't just actually bring them completely under his control. In 168 BC, and twice in that passage we read God's appointed time, so this is God's appointed time, Antiochus invaded Egypt, but this time unsuccessfully. And verse 30 tells us it was opposition from, and I, in, in my Bible says the ships of Kittim, some of yours will say the ships of the western coastlands, same, same thing. Also, kind of, it refers to Cyprus, and Cyprus is used as a regional name for where the, the, these ships came from. So, what this was is the Roman fleet, which had come to Alexandria, which is the coastline city there in Egypt, at the request of the Ptolemaic kings. Either Ptolemy the sixth or the seventh, or a combination of the two of them. Um, Rome was the growing power throughout the Mediterranean, had a big fleet. They knew that Antiochus was on the march again, and contact and Egypt was already becoming the breadbasket where grain was grown for Egypt, which would continue for centuries. And so they contacted their, their Roman friends and said, you need to help us. So the Roman Senate sends their fleet there to Alexandria. The Roman commander, and really, before I kind of get to that, um, we now really see this fourth empire that's going to replace Greece really come onto the map. And again, in all the previous, even in, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream and the statue and then the four animal uh, vision, all of this stuff, we always get to that fourth kingdom, which is Rome. And now we're really introduced to it in the story of Daniel as an actual power. So the Roman commander, one Gaius Populus Lanius. Oops, thought I had his picture. Um, he and his forces meet Antiochus about four miles outside of Alexandria. So he's made it into Egypt, but now he's opposed by a Roman force. Under a, a, a temporary peace treaty, the two commanders have a meeting, Antiochus and, and Gaius. Gaius hands him a letter from the Senate, from the Roman Senate, ordering him to leave Egypt or face war with Rome itself. And this story continues and has become all, actually almost legend. Because after Antiochus reads that letter. The commander Gaius, using his sword or a staff or something, draws a circle in the sand around Antiochus. You almost can see that in your mind's eye. He's talking to him, handing him the, the letter, telling him he has to leave. And as he's doing so, he's drawing this line in the sand until he draws an entire circle as he's walking around Antiochus, drawing this line in the sand around him. When he completes the circle, he then faces Antiochus and tells him, you have until you step out of the circle to make your decision. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big push. That's a big stare down. And again, from history, 
Antiochus, knowing his own time as a hostage, remembering the defeat of Antiochus III up there in Turkey, and how his 70,000 Syrians had been whooped by 30,000 Romans and was forced to pay tribute, causing him, Antiochus IV, who's standing here having to make this decision, be given hostage for a time in Rome. He has all of that in his background and his memory, and he capitulates, turns and leaves Egypt. He's humiliated. And so he needs somebody to take his wrath out of. So who better than the Jewish people as he's marching back to Syria? He's going to go right through the heart of Israel. Who better to take his vengeance out on having been humiliated by the Roman fleet, forced to leave Egypt, this time for good? So he takes his vengeance out on the Jews. He sends Apollonius down to it's he's his chief tax collector. He sends him down. He pretends to come in peace. Hey, I'm coming in peace. I'm just going to come down here, collect some taxes. No big thing. But then on the Sabbath, when everybody is either going to temple, uh, they're not working, they're not in the field, they're collected in their homes. On the Sabbath, he suddenly attacks with the forces he brought down with him, massacring a whole lot of people and plundering Jerusalem. You can read about this in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 30 and 32, and more of it in 2 Maccabees chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. So while everybody is peacefully going about their, their worship day, he attacks. I think back to my own time as a youth. Of course, a lot of you are saying, wow, that was a long time ago, and it was. But Sundays used to be a time when nothing was open. You couldn't run to a store. They weren't open. You had to get gas on Saturdays. The gas stations weren't open. There were a few that were open along... Um, I-17, or as we always called it, the freeway, because when I was a kid growing up here, that was the only freeway in town. So when you said the freeway, everybody knew what you were talking about. But you couldn't get gas. You couldn't go to the grocery store. There were uh, few, if any, restaurants open. Everything was shut down. So everybody was at church and then at home. That's kind of the picture here. So while everybody's gathered in one place and people aren't out and about, that's when Apollonius attacks. It does, he did, and again, it's recorded in Scripture, we just read it, he awards apostate Jews, like Millennius, that false high priest, who supported the Hellenistic practices that the Greeks were bringing in and trying to establish everywhere where they were in charge. So, I'm going to attack the people who are opposing me, but man, if, if you're following my stuff, you're going to get good stuff handed to you. Sounds very similar to what's going on in the United States today. If you're with an administration, they're going to give you handouts, 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 like us, like us, like us. If you're against us, we're going to attack you. Not quite in this way, at least not yet, but here being actually physically attacked and massacred. Later, uh, and this is verse 31, let me kind of catch that back up with you. His forces will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress. They will abolish the daily sacrifice and set up the abomination of des desolation. So in 167 BC, the persecution really ramps up because Antiochus isn't going to take no for an answer. He's going to go after Israel. He can't deal with Egypt anymore, so he's got this people group, this country to the south of him, and he's really going to show them who's boss. So he really ramps up the persecution as all Jewish religious practices. We're talking circumcision 
and possessing the scriptures, the sacrifices, the feast days, all of these were forbidden on penalty of death. Again, you could look, read about that a little bit in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 50 and 63. And now the imperial cult was introduced into the nation of Israel. You need to worship the imperial leaders. These are the people who represent the gods. And the climax really comes later that year in December when an altar or an idol or possibly both devoted to Zeus was erected right in the temple. So that's the abomination that causes desolation. Because then all the good, still practicing followers of God, followers of the law said, I'm not going in the temple while that thing is in there. So desolation, it's desolate. People are no longer going into the temple. And then about 10 days later, sacrifices were given on that altar, including pigs who were slaughtered and the pig blood spread around. And of course, the pigs are, an, are considered are an unclean animal. Read about that again in 1 Maccabees 147, 2 Maccabees chapter 6. They were offered desecrating the temple even further and making sure to drive off any other followers of Yahweh, of the Lord. Verse 32, Antiochus made promises, scripture calls it flattery, to try and entice people to his policies, which further corrupted apostate Jews, those who have violated the covenant. So those who aren't really following the Lord and following the law anyway, now he's given them government money to make sure that they are loyal to him. So you see, nothing is new. Nothing is different. We didn't invent this nonsense. This has been going on for a long time. There were still true believers. And scripture says there in verse 32, the people who know their God, who remain faithful. Then in verse 33, those who are wise. That can also read those who cause to be wise. Well, somebody who causes others to be wise is a teacher. This is probably the case here because then we see the next phrase, will instruct many. So we have those who still really know God's word, who really know the law, who know what it is to worship the true God. And they're teaching others to make sure that that knowledge is not lost, that that a correct worshiping of God is, is maintained in Israel. In the latter part of the verse, we see that some of these people are martyred. Let me just read verse 33 real quick. Those who are wise among the people will give understanding to many, yet they will die by sword and flame and be captured and plundered for a time. So these were Israelites who have spiritual discernment. They were true believers. Then in verse 34, during the oppression, those faithful to God, it says, will receive little help. It's not that we'll receive no help, but very little help will come their way. This seems to mean that at first there will be very few forces that oppose Antiochus. But again, as we know history, we know the history of the Maccabees, um, at the beginning of Hanukkah comes out of this. That will rise up and become a true opposition to Antiochus. But initially, there are very few who are willing to stand up against Antiochus and the Hellenist, Hellenistic teaching trying to be fostered onto the nation of Israel. The rest of the verse in there in verse 34 shows that the strength of that Maccabean revolt grows. Many uncommitted Jews in finally end up siding with the rebels and probably out of expediency as, as 
the rebels began to put to death anyone who collaborated with the Seleucids. First Maccabees chapter two. So as the as the Maccabees and the resistance grows, if you're not with them, they're putting you to death. Again, think about what's going on in Afghanistan with the Taliban. So all of a sudden you're going to find a lot of people that say, yep, we're loyal to the Taliban. Yep, yep, uh, I'm, I'm a Taliban supporter because otherwise it becomes deadly. So the Maccabeans themselves are putting it up, but now their numbers grow as people say, yep, I'm joining you. I'm going to be a part of what's going on. Finally, in verse 35, and we're finally going to get away from Antiochus IV in this prophecy of, of Daniel. It says that some of the wise will stumble. Now this kind of expresses the same thought as verse 33, that true, believer, true believers are end up going to be persecuted and even martyred for their faith. Again, this puts a big lie, and that same lie was being told in Israel, has been told in Israel as you study scripture from time to time. The same lie that's being fostered here in America is that if you follow the Lord, you are healthy, wealthy, and wise. You're going to live your best life now. But here I see true believers being persecuted and even martyred for their faith. Because they know that their best life is the life that is to come. Verse 35 also gives us the purpose of this ordeal. And it was to cleanse individuals and the nation as a whole of sinful practices and to strengthen their faith. This ordeal was designed to get all of the garbage and the riffraff out of the nation. To quit being double-minded, quit saying, well, I'll do some of this Hellenistic practices here because that's just good business. And then on Sabbath day, I'll worship God. And God says, no, I want to purify my people. So... This persecution is going to see to that. It also separated true believers from those unregenerate fakers within the Jewish community. In this context, then, the end that has been appointed by the Lord, I think, denotes the termination of Antiochus's persecution. That's the end that we see here. It's only for, as Scripture says, for a time. I've got it for a specific time. I've got a specific plan for it. It's going to be something good for the nation of Israel, for my people, for true believers, because I'm going to get rid of the garbage that has the weeds that have grown up in the midst of that crop and purify my people. Those suffering at that time would have been really comforted that there was a promised end to the ordeal they were experiencing. I, on a very small and minor note, and thank you again for praying for me with the, the kidney stone thing. I think that finally went away. Uh, but part of the biggest thing, and any of you had an a, a ongoing or chronic illness, you're always wondering, when am I going to be done with this? How long is this going to end? Well, the people here could get in and see, this is only for a time. There is going to be a finite end to this. This is not a permanent state of affairs. And with that, with verse 35, we close out Antiochus, and we close out all of what we know as history. And now we're going to pick up in verse 36 through Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, and we're going to look, it's still, all of this is future for Daniel. But now we're going to have a time jump to the final end of time. And as we've seen in other prophecies, there's often big gaps of time in things. 
Because in God's timeline, it's this, it's this, it's this. For us experiencing and living in time, well, what about all of this? That wasn't important. God says, here's my markers that I want you to see. So the next marker is one that is yet still future for us. All of the rest of this is history. It was all future for Daniel. And this last piece now, in, starting with verse 36, is still future for us today here in, in 2021. So let me pick up with Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, going through chapter 12, verse 3. Then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he will say outrageous things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, because of what has been decreed will be accomplished. He will not show regard for the gods of his fathers, the god longed for by women, or for any other god, because he will magnify himself above all. Instead, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god his fathers did not know, with gold, silver, precious stones, and riches. He will deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god. He will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing land as a reward. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, but the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, and many will fall. But these will escape from his power, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of the Ammonites. He will extend his power against the countries, and not even the land of Egypt will escape. He will get control over all the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and Cushites will also be in submission, but reports from the east and the north will terrify him, and he will go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain, but he will meet his end with no one to help him. Chapter 12, at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal control contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And with that, the prophecy here in, in this fourth vision comes to a close. Starting verse 4, and we'll cover that next week, Daniel's going to get his final instructions. The probably 85-year-old Daniel is going to get one final set of instructions, but that will be coming next week. So there are really two principal views on this entire section. The Maccabean thesis maintains that verses 36 to 45 still continue to talk about Antiochus IV. The problem is that much of the historical data in these verses is that, that says it's going to happen, you cannot even shoehorn into the life of Antiochus. So saying that, hey, you know, for Daniel to now be, or the angel who's telling this to Daniel to be talking about now a future king and armies from the north and the south and all this stuff. No, this is still Antiochus IV. There's more very specific things being told here, and you can't look at the life of Antiochus, and historians have tried and shoehorn this in. It just isn't there. Daniel also predicted that this king will come to his end in Palestine. But it's a matter of record, and we just read that, it's a matter of historical record that Antiochus IV dies at Tebe in Persia. So we have all of these prophecies, all historical for us, all have been fulfilled exactly as they've been written, 
And now all of a sudden we have some prophecies that if we try to make them fit with Antiochus IV, we can't fit in. And the fact is his death being in Palestine, we know where he died. Now all of a sudden the prophecies aren't accurate anymore. So that really can't, can't be. So this king, the king in this section, has to be someone else. The context has him living in the last days. Well, that's always a reference to just before the Lord comes. So we now know we have the actual little horn. Antiochus IV was a precursor, and now we have the guy that he was a picture of, the Antichrist. That's who we've now jumped to. The time of distress in chapter 12, verse 1, is the same distress predicted by Jesus in Matthew 24, 21. For at that time there will be great tribulation, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now, and never will again. So this time of distress in chapter 12, verse 1, there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since nations came into being. You see the same wording. It occurs immediately before his second coming. And when we studied Revelation, we saw that. And you, if you want to kind of do a reference, uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. So here Daniel is given that same picture that God later gives to John there on Patmos. And what Jesus predicted. All of them lining up perfectly. The clearest indication that this king will live in the last days is the resurrection of the saints that happen immediately after God delivers his people. Chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal con contempt. This is an eschatological event. This is the end time. This is Jesus Christ has come back and people have been raised. Finally, the wording here seems to introduce this king as for the first time. If you go back and, and read it in the Greek, this guy where Antiochus is just talking, and he and this guy is doing, all of a sudden it says the king. It introduces a whole new character from a linguistic standpoint. So we have that evidence as well. Conservative Jewish thought also teaches that this points to the Antichrist, that these verses here now point to the Antichrist. So conservative ancient Jewish teaching looks at the prophecy of Daniel and say, this is the Antichrist. We saw Antiochus, we know who he is, what he did, but this is that final guy. So having looked at his precursor, now we see the mo most notorious tyrant who will ever live. Everybody always likes to point to, you know, Hitler or Stalin, or you, know, you can name various evil rulers at times, or Nero, you know, all this stuff. This is the guy. This is the worst of the worst. So verses 36 to 39, there in chapter 11, relate to his character. And this, then verses 40 to 45 describe his end-time war stuff. Kind of the last half of the, the tribulation period, those last three and a half years, and the final battle, battle there at, of Armageddon at the Valley of Megiddo. And we see all of that listed here. So let's take a look at his character. He, scripture says he does as he pleases. Because of his personal charisma, and this guy is a, a charismatic, people want to follow him. His intelligence, his evil character, his political power, Antichrist will arrogantly believe that he can function sufficiently well without God. I don't need God because look how cool I am. 
Other passages seem to indicate that he will be an atheist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4, and then we'll go to Revelation 13, 6. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.4 He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's sanctuary publicizing that he himself is God. And Revelation 13.6 Talking about the Antichrist, the same guy. He began to speak blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven and those who dwell in heaven. So you can see how arrogant this guy is. I, you know, I'm above everything that is to be, that is ever worshipped. I'm the guy. This, the passage states that he'll reject whatever religion was practiced by his ancestors. If this individual comes out of ancient Rome, the chances are very good then that his family religion probably is some form of Christianity. Perhaps Catholicism. We don't. The phrase, the one desired by women, in a literal translation would be the desire of women. And some have looked at this and deduced that the Antichrist will be a homosexual. But that's not really clear. But I see where they go with that because it says he won't, particularly if you look at, at the Greek terminology, you can read it as him not having a desire for women. Um, and so they have, they have predicted that the Antichrist will be a homosexual. So that's a possibility, but it is not clear. I'm not staking, you know, my reputation on that. But if you do any self-study, you may see that out there, which is why I'm kind of putting it out. More likely, though, it has to do with the hope of Jewish women at Daniel's time, because that's he's writing to his local audience. And the hope of Jewish women at the time was that they would be the mother of the promised Messiah. The one desired by women. The Messiah. And they all were hoping, maybe I'll get to be the, the mother of that Messiah who's coming. It says that he rejects all worship of God and instead honors a God of fortresses, which is nothing more than military power. So he substitutes war for religion. It says also that he will attack in his character, this verse is talking about his character as God describes this guy, that he will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. The foreign god here is the god unknown to his fathers. And it's foreign in the sense that this deity was not worshipped by his ancestors. The people of the world will be so impressed by his might and his military prowess that they will say, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Revelation 13, verses 4 verse 4. Wow, who can stand up to this guy? So you can see where Revelation agrees exactly with the book of Daniel. Because it's God giving the prophecy to two men. Of course it's going to match exactly. People who vow allegiance to him will be rewarded. It says here, he will greatly honor them. He's going to grant them leadership positions. And give them territories to rule. Again, buying people off. Like we saw Antiochus the fourth do. So I'm controlling. I'm taking over this. Now you're loyal to me. I'll put you in charge of this. I'll put you in charge of this. I'll give you this area to rule. And make you a big deal. So that's his character. Now let's take a look at his wars. In the last battle, verse 45, 
He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain, but he will meet his end with no one to help him. We see the destruction of Antichrist there in Palestine. And it's immediately followed by the resurrection of the saints. Again, going back to what we know from Revelation, we, we've studied that and looked at that. We know that, bam, right when the whole world is coming together, it looks like it's going to finally destroy itself. Jesus comes back, stops the whole nonsense. Now kings of the south and north are in relation to Israel. So again, who's this being written to? It's being written by Daniel in Hebrew to Israelites. So kings of the north and south, that's going to be in relation to Israel. And it's kind of, it's a matter of conjecture and debate. And I've read a lot of them. as to who these these guys are. I'm always amazed when I read some of these people that give a definite answer and I read somebody else and he gives a definite answer that's different from the last guy who gave a definite answer. But the last battle in view is that of Armageddon, which you can read about from a different perspective in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. In verse 41, we see Antichrist invading Israel. But it's interesting that God says that Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon, referring to ancient countries north and southeast of Palestine, Jordan, who will apparently escape the battle. We don't know why. Are they an ally of Antichrist, so they don't aren't involved? Or are they just merely neutral parties? Are they kind of the Switzerland of their day? We don't know. But we know that they are spared from the attack and from the uh, occupation that the Antichrist brings against the nation of Israel. Egypt may be equated with the king of the south, but this title may refer the king of the south to a, another modern nation or a group of nations to the south of Palestine. Now again, I, I've read speculation on, on all of that. The Ten Nation Confederation to the south all of this sort of thing. A um, lot of times it's given the name Egypt simply because that was always the big power to the south. Verse 44 appears to indicate that this king will, will be joined by other nations. Verse 44. But reports from the east and the north will terrify him and he will go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. It looks like there, there's a, it's not just a single nation but a, a combination. Libyans, or what it says here, uh, you have Libyans and Cushites. Libyans designates the area in North Africa, west of Egypt. Anything west of Egypt was considered Libyans. And Nubians or Cushites, depending upon your Bible, is the area to the south, mainly Ethiopia and Sudan. It's uh, the African, the black African peoples, which at one time, Ethiopia and Sudan were the big powers. So it appears that the Antichrist, Antichrist conquests are in mind, so these African nations will be brought under his control. If the king of the south, though, represents an Arab block of nation, then all the riches of Egypt may include the great oil resources of the Middle East. If this is not Egypt, is Egypt is just kind of a title name, and it includes Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and whatnot, then that could very well, the riches of Egypt could be the oil reserves of that area. The reports that alarm Antichrist, though, after he's, he's done this, so after he's gotten control of this and kind of whooped to the south, he's, he hears that attacks have been launched against his interests from nations in the east. You can really see those armies described in Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 to 19, and more armies coming out of the north. 
in modern day thinking, of course, this is going to be China and possibly Russia. But the Antichrist responds in a great rage. I love that. He's ticked. We, remember, we've had three and a half years of peace, and now the, everything is falling apart in these second three and a half years. All those devastations that we read about in Revelation have happened. He's lost control, and now the king out of the east and the king out of the north are coming against him while he's there in with his headquarters in Israel, having whooped the guys to the south, taking care of control of their riches, which may very well be all those oil reserves, and now these other two groups are coming down saying, oh no, you're not taking the world supply of oil and controlling it yourself. The battle happens where Antichrist has his headquarters. I said, I, I, I'm just enthralled with the fact that he goes out in great rage to destroy and annihilate many. So the battle happens in Palestine. They're all coming in Israel. Everything's focused now on the nation of Israel where Antichrist has his headquarters. Now I gave you all those references. Those are on the bottom of your handout where you can look up and read other prophecies that all correlate with this as well. Finally, the career of the most evil man in history will be terminated. Paul said that this man of lawlessness will be destroyed, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. John, calling him the beast, says that he will be captured and thrown alive into the lake of fire, Revelation 19.20. Jesus comes back, takes him, and boom, you're out of here. And that leaves us now with... I'll give you a second to catch those up if you're taking notes. That meant, and again, those verses are written for you at the bottom of your handout. So now we have three different places where God says, I'm taking this guy out at the appointed time. So now we have final triumph in God rewarding his people. At that time, alludes to the period just described in, chapter, in verses 36 to 45. Antichrist's reign of terror at the time of the end. God has assigned this powerful angel, Michael, we've been introduced to him before, to watch over and protect Daniel's people, who will be in this time of great distress, the great tribulation. So they've got Michael on their side. The good news is that the Jewish remnant who have still made it through, who, have, who remain faithful, and we know that it's during this time that the nation of Israel will finally recognize the one whom he has pierced. And that's actually what I'm teaching on this morning here in Colorado, is the one who he has pierced when these people kind of dovetails right what we're talking about here, will find the Jewish people will recognize the one they have pierced and say, that is the Messiah, and turn to him in numbers. So this Jewish remnant that has survived, and all of other, all, any, all, all other people who have come to a saving realization of who Jesus is there in the tribulation, who trust in the Lord, having their name written in the book, will ultimately be delivered. Verse 2 has one of the best truths in Scripture, which is the resurrection. Here it is, right in Scripture, which is always amazing to me. Later in the time of Jesus, we have the two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. And yet here it is in the book of Daniel. Many of those asleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal contempt. Multitudes will be raised from the grave. So there are two groups with different futures. 
Believers will rise to enjoy everlasting life. By the way, this is the first time it's mentioned in the Old Testament. In new bodies and reign with Christ. Unbelievers will face eternal shame and contempt as they stand before the Lord. So Daniel gives the concept of eternal life and eternal punishment. In the Messianic age, believers will, it says, shine like the brightness of the heavens and like the stars forever and ever. So through words and deeds, God's children lead others to understand the call of the sovereign Lord upon their lives. They are the bright shining lights. This isn't a special class of saints, but as, as the Bible scholar uh, Baldwin writes, those who lead others to righteousness then are those who demonstrate their faith and encourage others to faith, and this is the humblest thing a believer can do, is to simply demonstrate your faith and encourage others to come to faith. Again, saints are described as, as shining like the brightness of the heavens. Christ declared at the end of the age, Matthew 13, 43, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. In this present world, Right now, many times believers are persecuted, misunderstood, misrepresented, suffer economically, are sued because they won't use their business to promote an evil, sinful lifestyle. Because of their spiritual priorities and are overlooked by the world, someday things will be different. So in just these few verses, we see a bodily resurrection. We find out the new body is immortal. Unbelievers will spend eternity in bodily form. The resurrected saints will receive great honor and great reward, while the opposite is true for unbelievers. And this, like I said, concludes the prophecy portion. Let me give you some take-home concepts. This has been a very difficult prophecy to go through, and I, I hope I've made it clear, but if I haven't, if you have questions, write them down, email them to me. Uh, bring them next week. I want to make sure this is clear because this is some great stuff. This tells us that this is only for a time. And we've looked at all of that past and how God predicted all that, and we can look at it in the past, it was all future for Daniel, and it all came true, so now we've looked at just this part that is still future for us, and know that if he was 100% on the rest, this is all going to happen the same way. So let me give you those take-home concepts, something to kind of put this all together in your head. In the first 35 verses, there are 135 prophecies which have been literally fulfilled and can be corroborated by a study of the history. The divine omniscience and omnipotence of the Lord is observed. No human can know the future apart from God, so there must be a God who revealed these matters. God foretells future events and therefore must have supreme knowledge and power over history. He's the one controlling it. Here's what's going to happen, and I'm going to make it happen. For those who live after the predicted events have occurred, that's us, the predicted events there up until verse 36, <coughs> there is confidence, or this is the confidence 
that since the previous prophecies have been fulfilled, the subsequent promises of deliverance and triumph will just as assuredly come true. The fulfillment of the predictions gives evidence that the scriptures are truly a product of supernatural revelation. <coughs> For those of you in class who are watching this on video, if you are one of those in chapter 12, verse 2, some to many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life, others to shame and eternal contempt. Everything that God has predicted up to this point has come true. Now you have to say, which of these two groups am I in? Because if all the rest of this come true, and he says that's coming, then that's coming. Now's the time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, oh, I thank you for Daniel, his willingness to listen and to write. Father, I thank you for the fact that you put it down for us here at Levine Baptist Church in 2021 to be reading and studying and looking and seeing this stuff, knowing that this is coming, knowing that the time is short, knowing that we need to be those bright lights that we were described here, to live our lives in such a way to draw people to you, to be willing to share and tell others about you, the true light. Father, this is coming as surely as the sun rises in the east, because you've said so. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your Holy Spirit has brought this clarity to our minds. Now, instead of it just being facts and figures stuck in our heads, Father, let us be changed forever when we walk out this morning, conformed a little more to the image of your Son, to bring, to herald the coming kingdom, because we just read that it's on the horizon. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing me to be the voice. These aren't my words. They're yours. I thank you for all of this, for all of those here today. In Jesus' name, amen.